Good morning. I'm going to look again at Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Matthew chapter 5, what is uh, commonly known as the Sermon on the Mount, where the Lord Jesus uh, presents the teaching that uh, applied to his kingdom. And so last Sunday we looked at the first four of the Beatitudes. There are eight of them in the opening verses of chapter 5, and we did look at the first four, but let's read those verses again from verse 1 of Matthew 5 down to verse 12. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of, <clears throat> excuse me, of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in the heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I emphasized last week that the Sermon on the Mount is not the essence of the Christian faith. The Sermon on the Mount doesn't tell us, um, well, this is what you should do in order to be a Christian. The Sermon on the Mount tells us that as Christians, this is how we should live. It's not about how we become Christians. It's about how we behave as Christians. And so when we come to these Beatitudes, then we have an eightfold description of those who belong to the kingdom of God. There are, we looked last week at, at uh, the first four, verse three, blessed are the poor in spirit, poor in spirit in the sense of recognizing our own spiritual bankruptcy, recognizing that we have nothing at all that we can offer to God. Blessed are those who mourn, recognizing sin, recognizing the evil that is in the world, and not only in the world, but in our own hearts. Blessed are those who mourn, on account of what they are and what they do. Blessed are the meek, not those who are self, uh, self-sufficient self and who are aggressive and looking for um, what it is that they think they, they merit or deserve, but rather those who are concerned about others and gentle in their approach to them. And then blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is a real desire, a passionate desire longing to be more like the Lord Jesus. That's what we looked at last week. And now we come to verse uh, 7, and he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We sometimes might use the words grace and mercy uh, together, but they're, 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 not, they're similar, but they're not, they're not the same. There is a difference between them. It's been suggested that grace imparts what Grace imparts what we don't deserve, and mercy withholds what we do deserve. There has been an attempt to distinguish between the two of them in that way. Grace imparts what we don't deserve, and it does. By grace we've been saved. We have this salvation. It's not something that we deserve. It is something which God has made available to us, and God has done for us in bringing us to the Lord Jesus. We have salvation. And in the broadest sense, that, account, that includes lots of things. It means that we are forgiven. It means that we're part of the family of God. We're sons of God. We're heirs of God. It means that the Spirit of God dwells within us. It means that ultimately the Lord Jesus will come for us and we're going to be glorified. We're going to be like the Lord Jesus. We don't deserve any of it. But by grace, we have been saved through faith. But then it said that mercy withholds what we do deserve. Mercy withholds what we do deserve. Well, certainly that's true sometimes, isn't it? For example, Paul tells us about his own experience in 1 Timothy chapter 1, and he says, Formerly, this is the kind of fellow I was. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy. 
because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. I didn't get what I deserved, Paul is saying. I was uh, one who obtained mercy. And the psalmist tells us that the same is true of all of us who know the Lord Jesus. Psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 103, verse 10, God has not dealt with us according to our sins. He hasn't given us what we deserve, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Mercy withholds what we deserve. We were reminded, those of us who were there this morning at our earliest service, that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what we deserve. We deserve the judgment of God. But mercy withholds what we deserve. However, I think that's an oversimplification to say that mercy always withholds what we deserve. I think oftentimes in Scripture we discover that it's got nothing to do with what we deserve. It is simply a case of an attitude towards those who are in need. Uh, for example, near the beginning of his ministry, the Lord Jesus uh, met two blind men, and they said, Have mercy on us, son of David. Towards the end of his ministry, interestingly enough, there were two more blind men that he met, and, uh, and they came with the same request, Son of God, have mercy on us. It's not that they deserved something. They were blind. They were in need. And the Lord Jesus, he responds to that need, and he restores their, their sight. It wasn't a case of um, not giving them what they deserved. It was a case of rather of recognizing that these were men in need, and the Lord Jesus was able to, to meet that need. It says about that second incident that he had, he had compassion. Four times in the Gospel of Matthew, we're told that the Lord Jesus had compassion. On one occasion, he sees the multitudes, and he and, and he recognized that they were they were lost and uh, and uh, without a shepherd. Looks like they had no shepherd. They're like sheep without a shepherd. He says, and he was filled with compassion, and he urged his disciples to pray the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his harvest. On another occasion, the multitude had been with him for several days, and the Lord Jesus he says to his disciples, "I have compassion on the multitude." because they've been with us for uh, several days and they have nothing to eat. And he responded to that. He met their need, fed them with seven loaves and, uh, and, with, uh, and with two fish. And then on another occasion, the Lord Jesus was confronted with the multitude and he had compassion and he healed their sick. And so there are four situations where people were in need. There was the blind, there was the lost, there was the, uh, the hungry, there were the sick. And in each case, the Lord Jesus reached out to them, and he met their need. It's not that he withheld what they deserved. That's not the idea at all. The idea simply is that here is a situation where people are in need, and he has what it takes, and in compassion, he reaches out to them and has mercy upon them and gives them what they need. And so a characteristic of those who belong to the kingdom is this. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. It means that we have a concern for others. It means that we forgive uh, those who offend us, recognizing that uh, there is certainly something that is wrong there, but we, we, we reach out to them in mercy. We forgive. It means that we love our neighbor. Our neighbor is the person that we know about who is in need, and we respond to that in the best way we can, as we have the resources to do so. It means that we have compassion on a world that is lost, indeed, a world that is perishing, a world that is hurting in so many ways. It means that we have a concern and that we do what we can to reach out to that world in order that they might come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And not only so, it means that we recognize the distress and the suffering and the pain that is there in the world, and we reach out as best we can to minister to them and to provide for them. We, we live in a world in which there is all kinds of suffering and anguish, isn't there? I mean, we think of the Ukraine, and uh, we think about what is going on. We think about famine in certain places. And uh, as we have opportunity, that we have opportunity, we should try to try to assist them. There are immigrants who come to this country, refugees. Well, 
if we could help them, we should help them, right? Mercy. Mercy is having compassion on those who are in need and reaching out to them as best we can. It's like the, the story the Lord Jesus told about the, the Samaritan. You remember there was this poor fellow who uh, finds himself in distress. Uh, he's uh, he's um, assaulted by thieves. They, uh, they beat him up and they, they steal what he has and they leave him there by the roadside half dead. And uh, the fellow, the uh, the priest and the Levite, they come along and they have no compassion. They just keep going. And along comes the Samaritan. And we're told that, that he had compassion. And he came where the man was and he ministered to the man in order that there might be some kind of relief from the anguish in which he had found himself. And so there's mercy. Mercy is reaching out to those who are in need and helping them as best we can. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The Lord Jesus tells a story in Matthew chapter 18 about a man who had, um, who, who had uh, received mercy. He was a servant of the king, <clears throat> and he owed the king a, a huge amount of money, uh, six million denarii. Doesn't matter what that amounts to today, because the point is not so much the quantity is the comparison. He owned six million denarii and he had nothing to pray. And so he pleads, he pleads for mercy. And the king has mercy and he wipes out the debt. And then he goes out and he finds uh, this man who owes him a hundred denarii. Six million versus a hundred. And when he gets a hold of this fella and he says, pay me what you owe me. And the man has nothing to pay, so he says, okay, you're going to prison until you pay me what you owe me. And news comes to the king about how he had treated uh, his fellow servant. And the king, well, the king was very disturbed, to say the least of it. And he brings the man before him, and he says, you wicked servant, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And uh, he puts him in prison, and... Uh, and, uh, and leaves him there. And the Lord Jesus, he concludes that story by saying this, so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. What we are told in this verse is not that acts of mercy, the acts of mercy are the cause of God's mercy towards us, but the, the evidence of it. If I have received mercy from God, if I have been forgiven, if I have been born into the family of God, then necessarily I understand something about mercy, and I should show mercy. And if I don't, then it really begs the question whether I know anything about the mercy of God at all. James, in his letter, he says it this way, judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And then in verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, therefore they shall see God. There's a verse in Proverbs chapter 4 that says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. The heart is the core of our being. The heart, uh, it influences uh, the, whole, the whole person. Oftentimes in Scripture, it's connected with the thoughts. And so, for example, we read uh, that as a man thinks in as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So he is. Uh, back in the days of Noah, the Lord Jesus, the God, God rather, he he saw the wickedness of man, and that it was great upon the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It begins with the thoughts. The heart is the seat of the the intellect of the thoughts, and and it necessarily has an impact on our desires and on our motives. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And it results in, in our actions. It has a very negative impact on how we behave. The Lord Jesus says that out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. It begins in the thoughts. And then it influences our desires and our motives, and eventually it issues, it issues in our actions. The heart, the heart. And when we read verses like that, we might well ask the, ask the question, well, how can we possibly be pure in heart? 
<laughs> the Lord says here, blessed are the pure in heart. Well, who among us would say that we have pure hearts? Well, I think there are two ways in which we might look at that. Number one, we can say with certainty that those who belong to the Lord Jesus, Christians, if you will, they already are pure in heart. They already are pure in heart in the sense that God has cleansed them. And remember the old hymn, what, shall, what, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me pure within? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Back in the year 1893, there was a World Fair, World's Fair in Chicago. And at that World's Fair, there was a parliament of religions. And there were spokesmen there for the numerous religions of the world. And uh, when they'd all had their opportunity, Joseph Cook was a Christian, and he had an opportunity to speak on behalf of Christianity. And uh, he introduced a woman to them. I don't know that the woman was actually here present, but he, he tells them about a woman. And he says, uh, gentlemen, uh, he says, uh, I beg to introduce you to a woman who has a great sorrow, blood stains on her hands. And he quotes actually from Macbeth, Shakespeare's play Macbeth. Lady Macbeth, uh, she had blood stains on her hands. She had been responsible for the death of King Duncan. And uh, she wanders through the night washing her hands or making that kind of action and uh, complaining, here's the smell of blood still, all the perfumes of Arabia shall not sweeten this little hand. And so Joseph Cook uh, challenged them, is there anything in your philosophies that will tell this woman how to get rid of this great sin? And of course, there, there were no takers. No one responded. And he says, well, let me ask somebody else. Let me ask John, the Apostle John, if he has anything to say about this. And he paused for a moment, and then he quoted from 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, every Christian has been cleansed. That is a one-for-all-time event. That's something that need never be repeated. When I trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, my sins were gone. I'm clean. In that sense, I'm clean. God looks at me and he says, uh, you are pure in heart. You are clean. Incidentally, this word pure, sometimes, quite often in the New Testament, it is translated clean. It's the same, it's the same word. And so he says to me, or he says about me, he's clean. He's clean. Why? Because of the blood of the Lord Jesus. And so there is a sense in which every Christian is pure, pure in heart. That having been said, we know perfectly well that that isn't true about our actions, is it? That's something altogether different. It's one thing, it's one thing to be pure in heart when it comes to my standing. It's another thing to be pure in heart when it comes to my practices. Who among us would say we are pure in our, our thoughts, in our desires, and our motives? We've got a long way to go, haven't we? All of us. We may have been Christians for a long time, but we're not there yet. We'll never will get there until the Lord Jesus returns and we find ourselves in his presence. And so how can I be pure in heart in the meantime? Well, I think what he's telling us uh, is this, that, you know, as a Christian, I already am pure in heart because of my standing. But as a Christian, I earnestly desire to be pure in heart as to my practice. And the psalmist, he says it in Psalm 119. He asks the question, how can a young man keep his way pure? And the answer, by guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Notice the words he uses, with my whole heart I seek you. It's similar, by the way, to what we had in verse 6, hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so here is this uh, desire, this earnest desire to, to be pure in heart. The word pure, it has the idea of being unmixed. And so it, there's a reference here to a heart that is unmixed, it's unadulterated. There is nothing there that ought not to be there. There's no hypocrisy uh, or falsehood or deceit or guile. You remember the Lord Jesus met Nathaniel, 
and his opening words to Nathaniel were, um, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Right, pure in heart. Not perfect, but pure in heart nevertheless. Somebody in whom there was no falsehood. Someone who was genuine and sincere. And, uh, and so it is that those who are pure in heart, in this, is, in, uh, who are, who, those who are Christians, they desire earnestly to be pure in heart in the sense that um, we become more and more like the Lord Jesus. We, we sincerely love him. We really desire to know and to do his will. And like the psalmist, we apply ourselves to the word of God and we apply the word of God to ourselves. And as a result of that, with the help of the Spirit of God, we are being changed. We are becoming more like we ought to be. We are becoming more pure in heart. And the day is coming when ultimately, look at what he says here, blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. That's what we have to look forward to. And then, then God's work in us will be perfected. And uh, John tells us that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then in verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. The Lord Jesus is a peacemaker. Ephesians chapter 2 describes him in this way. He is our peace. He is our peace. And that's said in Ephesians 2, and the context is that uh, Paul is talking about the difference there was historically between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews were God's chosen people. The Jews had the law. The Jews had the privileges associated with the temple and the law. The Gentiles, well, they were, they were outsiders. And uh, what he's telling us in Ephesians chapter 2 is that the Lord Jesus, um, he's our peace. He has made both one. And in the Lord Jesus, there are Jews and there are Gentiles. There are, no, uh, there are no preferences as far as God is concerned. We are equal partners. We share, share the same salvation on the same basis. And so he is our, he's our peace. He's the one who's brought about, who has brought about that peace. Paul in Colossians chapter 1, he says it differently. He says that he made peace. He made peace by the blood of his cross. He's a peacemaker. In that context, Paul, uh, he uses, interestingly, he uses two words, two words to describe what we were, and then two words to describe what we now are. And with respect to our past, he says, we were once alienated, once alienated. We were enemies, we estranged from God. It's not just that we were sinners, but we were enemies of God. There was hostility, and there was opposition. And God saw us in that light. God saw us as enemies, once alienated. And then Paul says, now reconciled, now reconciled, now brought into a relationship with God. Now the hostility is gone. Now, if you like, the war is over. Peace has been declared. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. There is this new relationship. And incidentally, when he talks about peace in that context, he's not talking about uh, peace of mind or tranquility of spirit. He's not talking about how I, uh, the, everything is just great and I feel calm and collected. That's not what he's talking about at all. It's not, it's not a subjective thing at all in Romans chapter 5 or in Colossians chapter 1. It is an objective fact. He made peace. Peace is something that I entered into when I trusted in the Lord Jesus. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. The war is over. That, that is something that nothing can change. It may be, it may be that uh, in my mind there is all kinds of confusion. It may be that I'm upset about one thing and the other. It may be that there's a good deal of turmoil going on in my heart. That doesn't alter the fact that as a believer in the Lord Jesus, I have peace with God. It's the relationship, you see. It's not, not the enjoyment of the relationship necessarily, but the relationship itself. Nothing can change that. When I trust it in Christ, I have peace with God. He is the great, he is the great peacemaker. But it's something which is uh, referred to a number of times in the New Testament as far as the Christian is concerned. 
And so, for example, in Hebrews 12, verse 14, we're told, pursue peace, pursue peace with all people, with holiness, without which no one can see the Lord. In Romans 14, 19, again, let us pursue the things that make for peace. Second Timothy 2, 22, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of pure, a pure heart. 1 Timothy, 1 Peter 3, 11, let him seek peace and pursue it. In all of those verses, there is this idea of, of desiring to be a peacemaker, pursuing peace and endeavoring to, to heal where there are relationships which have been, uh, which have been messed up. That there is a desire, certainly when it comes to our own relationships, there is a desire for reconciliation. We want to make peace. We don't want to be at enmity, but we want to be, we want to be together. We want there to be oneness. We want there to be forgiveness and reconciliation. And so that's something we should pursue in our own situation and in the lives of others as we have opportunity. It doesn't mean peace at all costs. Neville Chamberlain uh, went to, uh, went to um, where was it, Munich, I think it was, in 1938, <clears throat> and he returned to the UK uh, with, a, uh, with a promise, and so he thought it was a promise that would be good, and he declared, peace with honor. I believe it is peace for our time. And he felt that he had negotiated uh, a lasting peace with, uh, with Hitler. But peace and appeasement are not the same. Genuine peace is something that uh, you cannot have without principles. There must be a holding to certain principles. You've got to stand firm on the principles which obtain. And so it is that in the New Testament, uh, we are encouraged, you know, to, to, to contend, to contend for the faith. Martin Luther, he said, peace if possible, but the truth at any rate. Peace if possible, but the truth at any rate. It's not a case of anything goes, you know, I, I want to, I want to, no, we can't have any kind of disagreement. We, we must, we must, okay, so there is disagreement. Well, let's ignore that. Let's, let's all be one. Let's all be together and uh, let's enjoy, uh, and let's enjoy, enjoy peace. It, uh, it, it isn't, uh, it isn't the way to do things. Jude says we are to contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. Actually, the word he uses is the word that was used about a combatant in the in the games, and he's saying we're to contend as a combatant. Not that we have to be obnoxious, not that we have to be aggressive and argumentative. We have to be patient and kind and loving and respectful, but at the same time, we cannot compromise on the truth. And so sometimes it's necessary to to say the hard thing. Sometimes it's a case of, um, in a church, there is sin, which is public, and, um, and everybody, everybody knows about it. And uh, there is a need for the elders on behalf of that assembly to take action. Uh, you, you can't ignore it. You can't say, well, it's peace, peace, that's the important thing. No, we need to contend for the truth and act in a way that is consistent with the truth. And so he says here, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Called sons of God. It doesn't just mean that we're given that label, called sons of God. It means that we are, in fact, the sons of God. It means that we have this, uh, this status before God. Romans 8.15 says, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, we are sons of God. The adoption, by the way, is, was a word that was used in New Testament times, uh, not in a broader sense than we use it today. We think in terms of someone who has, uh, who is adopted into the family, and uh, he becomes part of that family, not, not, not born into the family, but adopted into the family. But in New Testament times, the adoption was something that happened when a Roman boy was around 13 or 14 years of age. And there was this, um, there was this ceremony in the forum in Rome, and uh, the father, he would bring his son there to that ceremony, and he would publicly acknowledge this child as his son. He would remove the, the toga, the toga praetexta, 
which had been worn by the boy up to that point in time when he would place on him the toga virilis. And virilis, it suggests what that means, doesn't it? It has to do with being a man. And he would say, this is my son. He was born into the family. But on that occasion, when that took place, there was a public recognition of his sonship, and he was saying, he is my son, he's my heir. He, he is part of the, not just part of the family, but he has this, um, this status. You remember the prodigal when he came home? Well, he really has messed up. Now he comes home and he says to his father, look here, I've sinned, sinned against heaven and before you, and uh, no more worthy to be called your son. Well, he can't change the relationship. He was born into the family, and uh, he was his father's boy. Nothing could change that. But he said, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Maybe one of your servants. And his father wouldn't have any of it. His father, uh, he welcomed him, didn't he? He put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, gave him a new robe, and, and in fact, uh, had, a, had a feast and celebrated the fact that this, his son had been lost. But now he was found. And so to be a son of God is to enjoy a status and a dignity. That's who we are. We're children of God. Children are born. When I trusted in the Lord Jesus, I was born again. I became a child of God. A son, that's a little bit different. Son isn't to do with birth. Son has to, son has to do with status and place. I am a son of God and an heir of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And then blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In verse 11, he says it twice. He says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, revile and persecute you. Well, certainly the Lord Jesus knew about that, didn't he? The Lord Jesus was persecuted right from the start of his ministry and all the way through those three and a half years until eventually it climaxed in his uh, crucifixion. The Lord Jesus was, was persecuted. He, he proclaimed the truth, didn't he? he? He told them the way it was and he exposed their hypocrisy and their sin. He challenged their traditions and he confronted them with what they were. And, uh, and he says, they hated me. They hated me without a cause. She said, if I hadn't come, they would have had no sin. They wouldn't have been aware of the sin, the sin to the same extent. They wouldn't have been aware of their attitude towards God as expressed in their attitude towards me. But he says, now that I've come, well, okay, their sin is apparent. They, they hated him. They hated him. They persecuted him. They reviled him. All the way through, they reviled him, didn't they? They accused him of breaking the Sabbath. Because he healed somebody on the Sabbath day, they accused him of having a Samaritan devil or being a Samaritan devil. He accused him of blasphemy. He accused him of dishonoring the temple. By, uh, and he accused him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub. They reviled him, reviled and persecuted. That was the experience of the Lord Jesus. And the Lord says, uh, on that last night with his disciples in the upper room, he says to them, you know, the servant is not greater than his master. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. That's the way it's going to be. A little bit later, he prays to his father. And in his prayer to his father, he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. The world has hated them. Because the word and the world, they just don't get along, you know, they're, they're opposites, right? They are always in conflict. There is a head-on collision between the Word of God and, uh, and the world and what the world wants. Uh, the message of Christianity is a message that is offensive to man, not a message that is palatable. It's a message which insists that there is such a thing as absolute truth. Well, that doesn't go over well in our society, our pluralistic society. That doesn't go over well. There is such a thing as absolute truth. The Bible insists on that. It insists that, but it insists that truth is in the word of God. It is in the spoken word, and it is in the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. He could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is such a thing as truth. There is such a thing as absolute truth. And our world preoccupied with what they call tolerance, and they, um, they don't like that. They hate that. 
the message of the Bible is such that it um, is contrary to so much that is going on in our society today. It teaches that a sexual relationship outside of marriage between one man and one woman, that's sin. That doesn't go over well. It decries the slaughter of the unborn. And it's tragic when you think about the millions who are being, who are being, uh, who are being killed. It tells us that there is no room for human pride. The message of Christianity, the message of the Bible is that we're sinners. And as we said, when we were looking at poor in spirit back in verse three, it means that we are destitute. It means that we are, we're bankrupt. It means that we have nothing to offer to God. That's not a message that sits well with people because there's no room for anything on my part. There's nothing I can take credit for. It means that I got nothing. And so it calls for humility. And there is no place for human pride. It's not a message that the world wants to hear. And the Christian message is one that declares that there is only one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that there is salvation in him. And apart from him, there is the looking forward to a judgment. That's not a message they want to hear. And so there is, um, there is persecution. We live in a society in which um, Christians and Christian, um, the Christian position is ridiculed. Christians are accused of being intolerant and ignorant and hateful. And so to speak against sin is hate. And to define marriage, as I already mentioned it, as a relationship between one man and one woman, well, that's to hate the LGBTQ community. And uh, to be pro-life, well, that's to hate women who have the right to make decisions about their own bodies and to insist that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. Well, that's not something that our, our society lives. That's to hate transgender people. And so we're accused of hatred. There's persecution and there is reviling. The Lord Jesus says, you can expect it. That's the way it's going to be. But he continues in verse 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The reason to rejoice. Actually, we have an example of it in, in Acts chapter 4, where uh, the apostles were arrested and they were put in prison and, uh, and they're, uh, they're, they're released and they come before the Sanhedrin again and the, the Sanhedrin tells them, look, you're not, to, you're not to proclaim this message anymore. And we are told that they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. No reason to rejoice when we experience persecution. But verse 12 goes way beyond that. Reason to rejoice when we anticipate what is going to be ours eventually. The persecution will end. Verse 10 at the end, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 12, great is your reward in heaven. And so there is to look forward to, isn't there? Paul says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. He says it again in Romans chapter 8, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so, blessed are, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Last week I mentioned that in the Sermon on the Mount, John Stott describes it as Christian counterculture. It is totally the opposite of what the world desires and the way in which the world behaves and thinks. And we see it here in these, uh, in these eight Beatitudes. The world says, blessed are the self-confident. The Lord Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. The world says, blessed are the light-hearted. The Lord Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. The world says, blessed are the strong and the brash. The Lord Jesus says, blessed are the meek. The world says, blessed are the shameless. The Lord Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. The world says, blessed are those who take vengeance. And the Lord Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. The world says, blessed are the self-indulgent. The Lord Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart. The world says, blessed are the aggressors. The Lord Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. 
The world says, blessed are those who are secure and popular and live at ease. And the Lord Jesus says, blessed are those who persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Father, we want to thank you again for this portion of your word. Thank you for the teaching of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the message that is there, the message that is relevant for us as believers in the Lord Jesus. And uh, we pray that we might recognize that this is his description of a Christian. This is the way we should be. And uh, we pray that we might uh, that we might make adjustments in our lives as necessary. You know, there are things here that uh, really, really, we really need to do something about. And there may be some here who don't know your father. Help them to understand that uh, the Christian message isn't that they should try to live according to these verses we've just read. But the Christian message is that they need forgiveness. They need to come to know the Lord Jesus. And they can do that only on the basis of their faith in him. We thank you for this time together, and we seek your blessing as we go our different ways. Be with us this day, we do ask, as we give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.